Prophet said, Feeling the Spirit to Asante. O Master, loves mankind, illuminate our hearts with the pure light of your divine knowledge and open the eyes of our mind to understand the teachings of your holy scriptures. Instill in us also the fear of your blessed commandments that we may overcome all carnal desires, entering upon a spiritual life, and understanding and acting in all things according to your holy will. For you are the enlightenment of our souls and bodies, O Christ God, and she we give glory to with your Father and your all holy, gracious, and life giving spirit, both now and ever and in the ages of ages. Amen. St. John the Evangelist, pray for us. The Father said, Feel the Espirit of Son of Amen. Hey. You can only take one Bible study at all right, so you all did your homework, I'm sure. Marianne, Marianne's going to lead the Bible study this week. She's got all these great insights. So, okay. Um, we finished up last week by just uh, quickly doing a little introduction to the Samaritan woman at the well in chapter 4. And... Um, Something I didn't point out, actually, in verse 1. Now, when the Pharisees knew that, or when the Lord knew that the Pharisees had heard that Jesus was back, was making and baptizing more disciples than John. So that verse connects us back with verse 22. After this, Jesus and his disciples went to the land of Judea. There he remained with them and baptized. So you get this connection between chapter 3 and chapter 4. So again... It's rather unfortunate that there's a chapter break there because it can lead us astray and, you know, we start, we break the story apart. When in reality, the story is continuing, as we're going to see, it's just really a short period of time is happening between chapter 2 and the end of chapter 4. And we read it over a long period of time. I know I keep saying that, but it breaks it apart for us instead of reading it all together. I recommend as you guys read along in John... Um, that you go back and start, I mean, how long does it take you to read from chapter 1 to chapter 4? In, you know, what, 20, 30 minutes? Maybe a little bit more? Not very long at all. So it's easy to go back to get the story all as one thing, instead of just chopping it up into chunks and trying to remember what was back there. Uh, if you do that each time, if you go back and repeat your reading, then that story is just going to get ingrained in you, so you know exactly what's taking place one time, one thing after another. So, um, what was the first question we asked last time about this scene of the Samaritan woman? At the well. Yeah, the well. Why was what's, the first, what's the first issue we run into? That she was a Samaritan. Yeah, that she's, that she's a Samaritan, right? He left Judea and departed again to Galilee, but what were you going to say? That he left Judea. Yeah, and actually that is important. Why? Why does he leave Judea? Because they're trying to kill him in that point? Well, I, I mean, we'd say it's almost implied here that there's something at least wrong. There's some friction between Christ and the Pharisees taking place. And it's and it's getting stronger. And I, and I suggested in the past that this has been going on from the beginning. That there's this friction behind the scenes. And it's going to come out all of a sudden when it does come out in John explicitly. And it's going to come out fairly soon in chapter, uh, in chapter 5. Suddenly they're trying to kill him. Okay, so there's been a lead up to it that John hasn't pointed to explicitly, but it's been there behind the scenes. By the way, they're having graduation tonight over here in the gym, so that's why that's all going on. So, what can I do? You should be quiet in a second. Regardless of me. Oh, because they're going in there. Um, okay, so what's the next issue then? Then he goes through Samaria, verse 5. So he came to a city of Samaria called Sychar, near the field that Jacob gave to his son Joseph. Okay, we did, have, did we go back and look at that in Genesis? Yeah, and it's simply the shoulder, right, or the slope of the hill, which was given um, to Joseph. Okay, and it's in Samaria, and so that's the next issue you have to deal with. Who are the Samaritans? Okay, if we're going to understand the background of the story, we've got to know who the Samaritans are. So who are they? The people that were occupied by the uh, Babylonians, and they were removed from their land and sent over to uh, Israel. Okay, close. But what's the, what's the background? First of all, before any of that, that kind of thing takes place, what happens? How does how Samaritans become the Samaritans? 
There were two kings that married. Okay, there was a division in the kingdom, right? Northern kingdom and a southern kingdom. Right. There was a there was a break, a schism. Remember the son of Solomon, whose name was Jeroboam. Rehoboam. Right. And the other guy, Jeroboam. And Rehoboam, Solomon's son, the bad guy. Okay. And so there's a, a, a break within the kingdom. And the north breaks from the south, and the south becomes, or it's just simply the tribe of Judah, okay, and what other tribe? And Benjamin. Okay, but Benjamin's basically been swallowed up by Judah by this point, okay? So the southern kingdom is just called Judah, which is where we get what name? Jew. The Jews, okay? And in the north, it uh, becomes called, well, what? Before it's called Samaria, what's it called? Israel. Israel. Yeah, Israel. So that's important because otherwise we get confused in the Old Testament for reading, okay, that Israel, it, when they we're talking from the standpoint of the prophets, Israel is a kingdom in the north that is in schism or is broken from the, from the throne in Judah and Jerusalem, okay, they're no longer obedient to the king, okay, and Israel's capital, capital is what? Now, Israel's capital in the north. Okay, look at 1 Kings. Look at 1 Kings. Turn to 1 Kings. Oh, my gosh. Turn to 1 Kings. Chapter 16. Yeah? Jennifer! How are you doing? Which verse, though, to Chapter 16, verse... Um, well, verse 21, we could look at real quick. Then the people of Israel, in chapter 16, verse 21, then the people of Israel were divided into two parts. Now, that's, this is a little, kind of a little civil war break within this northern tribe, or this northern kingdom, I mean. Okay? The people of Israel, the people in the north, broke into two parts. Half of the people followed Tibni, the son of Ginnah, to make him king, and half followed Omri. But the people who followed Omri overcame the people who followed Tibni, the son of Ginnah. So Tibni died, and Omri became king. In the 31st year of Asa, king of Judah. Okay, now, notice, it, that's oh, it's, in 1 Kings, remember, it's always talking like that. The king in Israel is told, is told when he becomes king, or begins to reign, by what year the king in the south is being is reigning, and vice versa. Okay? So you get that reference to the king of Judah. In the 31st year of Asa, king of Judah, Omri began to reign over Israel. So, in other words, in the 31st year of Asa, king in the south, Omri began to reign in the north. And he reigned for 12 years. Six years he reigned in, in Tirzah. He bought the hill of Samaria from Shemer for two talents of silver. And he fortified the hill and called the name of the city which he built, Samaria, after the name of Shemer, the owner of the hill. Okay, so Samaria ends up becoming the throne city in the north. Okay, and over time, that throne city, the name of the throne city, becomes the name for the whole northern kingdom. Okay, or oftentimes it's the whole northern kingdom referred to as Samaria. Okay. Um, now, what happened? He's mentioned. What happened to them, the Samaritans, this northern kingdom? What happened to them over time? They're conquered. By who? The Assyrians. Yeah, the Assyrians. You said Babylonians, but remember the Assyrians are the ones that come in first. Assyria rises to power uh, around 800 B.C. and then comes down and in 721, I believe, conquers the northern kingdom. And when the Assyrians conquer, what do they do? Displace the spell. People out and bring the other people in. Yeah, exactly. Turn to Second Kings. Chapter 17. Yeah, the Assyrians weren't stupid, right? They're, they if they wanted to control a people, they didn't want to leave them in their own land where they could have they could rise up. Instead, they took them out of their land and replaced them with other people. Okay, chapter 17, verse. Uh, Verse 24. Sheila, you want to read that for us? You can, you can kind of skip those names. Um, and the king of Assyria brought people from Babylon, Pisa, Abba, Hamath, and Nebar, Jireh, and Gordon, and placed them in the cities of Samaria instead of the people of Israel. And they took the 
possession of Samaria and dwelt in its cities. And at the beginning of their dwelling there, they did not fear the Lord. Therefore the Lord sent lions among them, which killed some of them. So the king of Syria was told, The nations which have carried away a place in the cities of Samaria do not know the law of the God of the land, and therefore he has sent lions among them. And behold, they are killing them, because they do not know the law of the God of the land. Then the king of Assyria commanded, Send there one of the priests whom he carried away thence, and let him go and dwell there, and teach them the law of the God of the land. So one of the priests whom they had carried away from Samaria came and dwelt in Bethel, and taught them how they should fear the Lord. But every nation still made gods of its own, and put them in the shrines of the high places, which the Samaritans had made, every nation in the cities in which they dwelt. Okay, so you get this uh, polytheism which develops, right? They worship the gods of these, of these people that were brought in, but also the god of the land, okay? Um, Carson says this about the Samaritans. Samaria had no separate political existence in Jesus' day. It was united with Judea under the Roman procurator. Nevertheless, for both Jews and Samaritans, the area was defined by both history and religion. King Ori named the new capital the northern kingdom Samaria, which name was then transferred to the district and sometimes to the entire northern kingdom. After the Assyrians captured Samaria in 722, 721 BC, they deported all the Israelites of substance and set of the land with foreigners who intermarried with the surviving Israelites and adhered to some form of their ancient religion. After the exile, Jews returned to their homeland. The remains of the southern kingdom viewed the Samaritans not only as the children of political rebels, but as racial half-breeds whose religion was tainted by various unacceptable elements. About 400 BC, the Samaritans erected a rival temple on Mount Gerizim, and which is the sh they're under the shadow. This conversation with Jesus, the Samaritans having with Jesus, the Samaritan woman is having with Jesus, is under the shadow of Mount Gerizim. Okay. Now, about 400 BC, the Samaritans erected a rival temple on Mount Gerizim. Toward the end of the second century BC, this was destroyed by John Hyrcanus, the Asmonean ruler of Judea. This combination of events fueled religious and theological animosities. Certainly, by the first century, the Samaritans had developed their own religious heritage based on the Tentatum. They did not accept the other books of the Hebrew Bible as canonical, continuing to focus their worship not on Jerusalem and its temple, but on Mount Gerizim. A small number of Samaritans survives to this day. Okay? So, a um, couple things you got to know. First of all, the place where this conversation is going on is within the shadow of their temple where they worship these gods. Okay? Um, and second of all, I have a second point. Oh, that they only accepted the Pentateuch, the first five books of the Old Testament. Okay? The writings of Moses. Why would they reject the prophets? Do you think? They would talk about Jerusalem more. Okay. Well, they had all these false gods that they were worshiping. Okay. So clearly, the prophets are going to tell them to return to the to the one true God. Yeah, they don't want to hear that. The prophets railed against the north. Okay. Uh, so it's um, it would have been fitting for them to be like, okay, you guys forget you guys. We don't want to mean to do with you because you reject us. Okay. So they only accepted the first five books of the Old Testament. Okay, go back to John. How's it going, Carrie? All right. Chapter 4, verse 1. Sheila, go ahead. Read mm -hmm. verse 1 through... Uh, I'll tell you what, why don't we read through verse 15, and then we'll come back and take it apart. Now when the Lord knew that the Pharisees had heard that Jesus was making and baptizing more disciples than John, although Jesus himself did not baptize, but only his disciples, he left Judea and departed again to Galilee. He had to pass through Samaria, so he came to a city of Samaria called Sephar, near the field that Jacob gave to his son Joseph. Jacob's well was there, and so Jesus, weary as he was with his journey, sat down beside the well. It was about the sixth hour. There came a woman of Samaria to draw water. Jesus said to her, Give me a drink. 
for his disciples had gone away into the city to buy food. The Samaritan woman said to him, How is it that you, a Jew, ask a drink of me, a woman of Samaria? For Jews have no dealings with Samaritans. Jesus answered her, If you knew the gift of God and who it is that is saying to you, Give me a drink, you would have asked him, and he would have given you living water. The woman said to him, Sir, you have nothing to draw with, and the well is deep. Where do you get that living water? Are you greater than our father Jacob, who gave us the well, and drank from it himself, and his sons and his cattle? Jesus said to her, Everyone who drinks of this water will thirst again, but whoever drinks of the water that I shall give him will never thirst. The water that I shall give him will become in him a spring of water, welling up to eternal life. The woman said to him, Sir, give me this water, that I may not thirst, nor come here to draw. Okay, now you guys are at this point have the tools to, to take this text apart. Okay, so I'm going to do my best to shut my mouth and let you do it. Okay, first of all, we, well, we, we mentioned it last time right at the end. Okay, and that is the whole scene where it's taking place and what's taking place. Okay, in verse 6, where is it taking place? Well, Jacob's and, yeah, Jacob's well. And when is it taking place? At noon. Okay? And those two facts, and plus we get this, this, this points us to Jacob, okay? And we've got a man there in the person of Jesus who has just been identified in John as the bridegroom, right? A few verses before this text. Okay? And suddenly there's a woman there. So we've got all these ingredients going into it. Okay? And and what back what old testament background do we need then that helps us? The well. The well. What what about the well? What happened at wells? What happened at wells? Should we go through the text? Well, we're not going to go to them because it would take us forever, right? But I point I gave you the, the, the chapters and verses last time. You guys weren't here? Find you bribes. Well, yeah. the first example he gave was Abraham sending his servant to find his yeah. wife. Right, go ahead. And he finds Rebecca there, and the sign he asks for is to whichever woman he says, give me a drink, if she gives it to him and then feeds his camels, okay, or waters the camels. Right. And then the other one is Moses. Uh-huh. He, well, not just the other one. There's three times, right? Yeah. So number okay. two is Moses. Is that the one in Exodus? And he rescues oh. somebody's daughters. Okay. All right. And also, this is at a well. And then yeah. he buries one of them there. Okay. And then the third one is... Is our main man. The main man, Jacob. Jacob. Finding Rachel. Right. Because she comes to water her flock. At what time? The sixth hour. Yeah, so there's this whole, this whole Old Testament background that when there's a well and a guy shows up and a woman shows up, they get married. Okay, so all the time when there's a well in the Old Testament, people get married around it. Okay, so there's this whole marital background going on. Now, why is that important for us? Why is that important in the background of what's going on in John, in the background of the Samaritans, in the background of the Jews and all of that? I mean, it's going to be important because if Christ has just been identified as the bridegroom, mm-hmm. then you can expect that there's some sort of marriage. All right, they're pretty stupid. All right. Are you telling me Jesus is getting married? No, but it's so Well, hold on, let somebody else answer. <laughs> Are you telling me Jesus is getting married? He's the bridegroom. Why is he the bridegroom? I mean, you guys are weird. You know, I mean, that just sounds weird. Jesus didn't get married. What's that? But you know he's a celibate priest? Yeah. All right. What's that? He's addressing all of humanity. Okay. Give me more. All of us are our rights. Okay. Yeah. And the choice in the church is the bride? All right. That's all good. Those are all good ingredients. Now let me just kind of put that in intelligent order for you guys. That... In the Old Testament, oftentimes Israel is spoken of, Israel, and you know, before the system here, um, is spoken of as the bride of God. Why? Why? Because she's the chosen, or yeah, she is his chosen people. Yeah.
that and what happens in marriage? Covenant union. Yeah, covenant union. Even back in Genesis, we've seen that, right? That desire of God to share his life with his people. So when the Savior comes to save mankind, what's he going to accomplish? The covenant union, which was supposed to happen in the beginning. Okay? God wants us to be united to him. And so when Jesus comes, we, saw this, we see all this marital imagery coming out. Okay, we see John repeating that seven days of creation was the, the day of covenant when there's a marriage feast at Cana. Okay? And again, here he comes. And we can see even that imagery in Nicodemus as he's being called to Christ. Okay, but here it's, it's a lot of the imagery comes out of it stronger. Okay, so we're at a well, we're at a noon. John's giving us this information to help us out, to help us interpret the text. Okay? Um, all right. Verse 7. There came a woman of Samaria to draw water. Jesus said to her, Give me a drink. For his disciples had gone away into the city to buy food. Now, we need one other thing I forgot to tell you. And that is, in every story in John, pretty much, what, are, what thing do we have to be aware of? What reality that John's always using? What's that? Yeah, two levels of, of, um, of interpretation or understanding. Okay, the level of the flesh and the level of the spirit, or the level of the law and the level of, of creation, or whatever it's grace and the, and the Old Testament. Okay, all that. We have grace and nature, all of those things. Okay, there's two levels. And and oftentimes, people do what? And they're just hearing Christ in the story. They just hear it on the natural level. Yeah, so for example, Nicodemus, our Lord says, you must be born on oath then, which can be interpreted as being born from above or being born again, and he understands it as being born again on the natural level. Similarly here, the word for well used in uh, verse 6, Jacob's well was there, okay, and, and, and sat down beside a well. The word in Greek is hege or pege, okay, which can be translated as what? What? Well. <laughs> No, it actually there's a, a deeper connotation than just well. It can be translated as, um, in, it's a type of well. There's different words for well, okay, that can be used. But this particular, yeah, bingo, right there, you got both of them, okay? It can be, well, I shouldn't say you got both of them. Another word, I'm not even sure how to pronounce it, a fruit, free or something like that. Is a word for sister, okay? Which is simply a stagnant well that goes down and and water kind of collects into it, okay? But there's another word for well in the Old Testament, okay, or in uh, in Greek that can be translated in two ways, okay? And it's this word page, okay? And it can be translated as running, okay? In other words, a well with fresh water coming into it, okay, or living, which actually is really the same kind of thing, isn't it? You could say both. It's a living well or a running well. It's the same kind of thing, okay, but living could also be... Is this an adjective describing well, or is it actually a living well, running well? Is it one word, or is it... It's one word. It's part of the definition you say. Yeah. So it's a noun, not an adjective. That's what I thought. Yeah, I guess. If I knew Greek better, I'd be able to answer you better. But, you know, that's what I know. It's about the level of the knowledge I'm at. Peter, you know a little Greek, don't you? Yeah, it's a noun. Yeah, okay, it's a, yeah, it's a noun, and it's, it's, living well. it's a type of well. Yeah. Right. So, uh, are you saying that in this chapter alone, they use two different Greek words to... Actually, they do use two different Greek words, and in this particular instance, in this particular verse, okay, this idea of running, or life-giving, or living well is used to describe the well. And in fact, we know this well to this day where it's at. You can go there and drink from the well. Okay? And the well is both a cistern, okay, and a living well. And the reason this is both is because the the well is extremely deep, and the fresh water that comes into it comes into it way, way, way down at the very, very bottom. Okay? It's important for us in reading the text. 
Verse 7. There came a woman of Samaria to draw water, and Jesus said to her, Give me a drink. For his disciples had gone away into the city to buy food. The Samaritan woman said to him, How is it that you, a Jew, ask a drink of me, a woman of Samaria? For the Jews have no dealings with Samaritans. And Jesus answered her, If you knew the gift of God and who it is that is saying to you, Give me a drink, you would have asked him, and he would have given you living water. Life giving water. Okay? Now, there's a couple of interesting things we need to look at in the Old Testament. Okay, turn to Jeremiah chapter 2. You know what I'm talking about? What? What? Did you just tell me the story. No. Ezekiel. Turn to Ezekiel. I'm not going to bless you. Sorry. I'm not going to make you guys do this too much. This is the last one. Turn to Ezekiel chapter uh, 47. This is Ezekiel's vision of the temple in Jerusalem. Oh, is this when he walks out and the water gets higher and higher? Mm -hmm. Is that yes. Chapter 47. <laughs> Go ahead, Sheila. Okay, I haven't found it. Oh, okay, that's okay. Sorry. Okay. Mary, are you there? Yeah, what verse? Uh, chapter 47, verse 1. Okay. Then he brought me back to the entrance of the temple. There water was flowing from below the threshold of the temple toward the east, to the temple faced east. And the water was flowing down from below the south end of the threshold of the temple, south of the altar. 
Then he brought me out by way of the north gate and led me around on the outside of the outer gate that faces toward the east, and the water was coming out on the south side. Going on eastward with a cord in his hand, the man measured 1,000 cubits and then led me through the water, and it was ankle deep. Again, he measured 1,000 and led me through the water. It was knee deep. Again, he measured 1,000 and led me through the water, and it was up to the waist. Again, he measured 1,000, and it was a river that I could not cross, for the water had risen. Okay, so in Ezekiel, this water is, this life giving water is flowing forth from the temple. Okay? And we, as we saw earlier, that God is identified as the source of living water. Okay? There's two images that we keep in mind. Okay? Did we identify that? Or where? In Jer- was it in Jeremiah? Jeremiah chapter 2. Oh, I, okay. Remember? It says, it. They have, they, yeah, My yeah. people rejected me, their source of living water. Okay? So it appears as though Christ is pulling up this, this Old Testament images for us. Okay? Making an almost explicit reference to Jeremiah as the source of living water. Okay? And also, all of these things in the prophets, and those are just a couple of samples of this life giving water which flows out of Jerusalem. In Ezekiel, it flows out of the temple itself, which would make sense because Jerusalem is, a, is a, say, a macrocosm of the temple, or the temple is a microcosm of what Jerusalem should be. Okay? And so, there's all these images in the prophets. Okay? So turn back to John now. I'm going somewhere with this, don't worry. Chapter 10, or verse, sorry, chapter 4, verse 10. John 4, 10. Jesus answered her, If you knew the gift of God, and who it is that is saying to you, Give me a drink, you would have asked him, and he would have given you living water. Okay, if you knew the gift of God, what? What's that? call up for you. What's that bring up for you? Grace upon grace. Good. Prologue. Where is that? In the prologue. Alright. Remember I told you, you got to know the prologue. Okay? Chapter 1 verse 14. 14. No, 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 no. 15. 16. Uh, 16. Verse 16. Go ahead. And of his fullness we have all received in grace for grace. A grace upon, upon a grace, right? Or a gift upon a gift. Okay? And keep reading verse 17 because it tells you about that gift. For the law was given by Moses, grace and truth came by Jesus Christ. Okay. So what is this gift upon a gift? It's something that builds upon the law. So if the law was the first gift, then grace is that which builds upon the law. Okay. So what's the first gift? The law. The law. Okay. For the Jews, the gift of God was the law. Okay, which properly speaking, in its smallest form, if you will, was simply the Torah or the first five books of the Old Testament. Okay? But in fact, the whole gift of God was the whole of the Old Testament, the whole of the Hebrew Scriptures. Okay? And so Jesus says to the Samaritan woman, if you knew the gift of God, you would have asked oh, me. The now, to include, uh, plus the stuff that the Samaritans reject, is that what you're saying? Yes! Okay, the, the Samaritans only accept what? The Pentateuch. The first five books of the Old Testament. Oh. However, first few. look at the references that we just looked at about life-giving water flowing forth from Jerusalem, mm-hmm. flowing forth from the temple and coming from God himself in that day, in the Messianic day. If you knew the gift of God, implying what? She doesn't know the gift of God. Okay? And in fact, she struggles to understand what he's talking about. Why? She doesn't know any of the prophets. And the prophets are all the ones that make these references to this life-giving water which will flow forth from the temple on the day of salvation. Let's push a little bit further here. Okay, This whole text is being given to us in the context of what event that happened in John. What a great event happened in John that now all of this is flowing from. Can I ask a question? Yes. The Samaritans only accept the first five books. Yes. But the other group of people that accept the broader series of texts are called the what? The Jews. The Jews of the day. Yeah. The Israelites. Yeah. And we would just refer to them as Israel or the Jews. I mean, at this point. So they accept the totality and the balance of the Old Testament right. to that point. Right. Including the five books. 
That's right. Yeah. What I'm saying, even those five books are for them, are, are in a sense even more elevated. They're written by Moses. They are the Torah. They are the, the foundation or core of the whole of the revelation. But they're not all of it. So even back in the day of this writing, the same thing was happening between the Samaritans and the Jews that's happening today between the Protestants and the Catholics. In some sense, yes. More or less. In some sense, yes. Yeah, that's a good insight. Okay. Although I wouldn't make the Protestants out to be Samaritans because the Samaritans are polytheists. So. That's me. We'll be gentle. I'll leave a picture here. The Samaritans were which? They were polytheists. Polytheists. Huh? Yes, you came in a little late. Yeah, you missed that part. All right. <laughs> Um, all right, so where were we? What did I ask you a question? What was it? Everything flows out of which event? The creation. No, no, no. In John, what event yeah, is the creation? The creation at the beginning of John. Yes, that's true. However, look. The baptism. Yeah, no. What great event took place that's bringing upon a, a, this whole thing? First of all, Nicodemus comes down to Jesus and says, we've seen what you've done. And then right at the beginning of the story, uh, the Jesus is man. fleeing. Well, just after that. I mean, yes, in some sense, you guys are both right. But Jesus is fleeing from Judea to avoid the Pharisees because of what? Is that more people than John? They want to kill him? Yeah, he talks the people out of the temple. Yes, because of the cleansing of the temple. The cleansing of the temple becomes this great sign in John, which is which happens, which takes place, that we have all this reaction from. And what happened in the cleansing of the temple? Who did Jesus, what did Jesus identify himself as? The temple itself. Yeah. Destroy this temple, and I will rebuild it in three days. Okay? Now I want to connect one quickly to Nicodemus. One point in Nicodemus is important. And that is a difficult text of Wait, Jesus. Wait, so you know, I missed something. How, what's the connection between the, what's happening in the temple and then chapter 4? Oh, we're going to get there. We need to hold on. Hold this all together. We're gonna, I thought you were just going to go back. No, because I went to chapter 2, and then we went to chapter 3, now we go to chapter 4. Hold it together. Hold on. It's all going to come together here. Okay? Because there's, look, we're reading this over weeks and weeks and weeks, and it gets confused, okay? So look. So Jesus identifies himself as the temple, which is the central point of worship for the Jews. Okay? And in fact, our Lord, in his conversation with Nicodemus, says what? Just as the serpent in the desert was lifted up, so must the Son of Man be lifted up, that all who look upon him and believe will be saved. Okay? Jesus is going to become for us the central place of worship because he is the glory of God. As we saw in verse 14 of chapter 1, right? Jesus is the revelation of the glory of God, and it was that glory of God which was the revelation of the dwelling place of God in the Old Testament. Are you guys with me? Kind of? Mary Ann, you're sorry. lost. I'm sorry. All right, now, we come back to chapter, chapter uh, 4 with the Samaritan woman. Okay? Wait, can we just rehash everything you just said, though? No. Okay. We can come back to it. Chapter 4, verse 49. No, yes. Sorry, sorry, sorry. I was looking at that. Chapter 4, verse 10. Jesus, I'm just trying to figure out what is it. In hold on, hold on! <laughs> Chapter, verse 10. Jesus answered her, If you knew the gift of God and who it is that is saying to you, Give me a drink, you would have asked me, asked him, and he would have given you living water. What do you think Jesus means there? Do you think he would have given her running water from the well? No. Okay. But how is she going to understand him? My dear readers of the Nicodemus story. She's going to understand him on the natural level because she doesn't know the prophets. Verse 11. And the woman said to him, Sir, you have nothing to draw with. And the well is deep. Where are you going to get this running water or living water? In order for Jesus to draw from this well and to get living water or running water, he's got to get a container to go way, way, way down to the bottom. And my dear friends, he's empty-handed. And she's going, <laughs> how are you going to get living water, buddy? you got nothing to draw with. <laughs> are you greater than our father Jacob who gave us 
against the will, and Drake committed himself to his sons and his cattle? What's the answer to that question? Yeah. Yeah. Okay, yes, he is greater. And not only that, again, she misunderstands the living water. She's understanding him on that natural level. Christ is talking on a supernatural level. That life-giving water, that life that he's going to bestow upon her. Okay, yeah. So if she was a believer, and she did ask him for the living water, Mm -hmm. what would he have? And we're about to find out. Because she's about to get it. Alright, he's about to give it to her. (laughs) Verse 13. Jesus said to her, Everyone who drinks of this water. You notice the parallel between the Nicodemus story and this and the story. Because Jesus says, comes and says to Nicodemus, you might be born again. And she says, or he says, How many how can I be born again from my mother's womb, right? And then what is Jesus? Does he let up? No, he explains it again. And so it's exactly the same format. Verse 13, Jesus said to her, Everyone who drinks of this water will thirst again. But who, Nicodemus, whoever's born of flesh is flesh. But whoever drinks of the water that I shall give him will never thirst. The water that I shall give him will become in him a spring of water, welling up to eternal life. And the woman said to him, Sir, give me this water that I may not thirst, nor come here to draw again. So she's still what? She's still thinking. He's talking about this living water at the bottom of the well, or whatever she's going to get. But she's not understanding him on a supernatural level. Okay? She's not ascended with him to the Father, if you will. Okay, you guys with me? Yes. Okay. Verse sixteen. Jesus said to her, "Go, call your husband and come here." Let's go ahead and read verse sixteen through twenty-six, and we'll go ahead and rip that apart. Okay. So, Jesus said to her, Go, call your husband, and come here. The woman answered him, I have no husband. Jesus said to her, You are right in saying, I have no husband. For you have had five husbands, and he whom you now have is not your husband. This you said truly. The woman said to him, Sir, I perceive that you are a prophet. Our fathers worshipped on this mountain. And you say that in Jerusalem is the place where men ought to worship. Jesus said to her, Woman, believe me, the hour is coming when neither on this mountain nor in Jerusalem will you worship the Father. You worship what you do not know. We worship what we know. For salvation is from the Jews. Okay. One of the Hebrew words for husband, common Hebrew word for husband, especially used in the Old Testament, is Baal. Okay, you've heard that word before. Yeah. Not always in reference to husband, but most of the time in reference to what? A god. A bad god, right? And it can be translated as Lord or husband. Okay, again, understanding the text on two levels. Now, he says, what does he say to her? In verse, what, 16? Jesus said, go call your your husband or your Baal, your Lord, and come here. The woman answered him, I have no husband. I have no Lord. And Jesus said to her, you are right in saying you have no husband. For you have had five Baals or five husbands or five Lords. And he whom you now have is not your husband or your Baal or your Lord. Okay, now, go back to 2 Kings. We already looked at this text one time. 2 Kings chapter, where do I want to go? Chapter 17. Verse 24. And the king of Assyria, you guys with me? No. And the king of Assyria brought people from Babylon, Kutha, Ava, Hamak, and Sepharvaim, and placed them in the cities of Samaria. And each of these places brought what? Their gods. Their gods. Their Baals. 
whom the Samaritans then worshipped. However, there was another Baal, or another Lord, or another husband that was brought in. And who was that? Yahweh. Yahweh. Okay. Now turn back to John. Verse 16, And Jesus said to her, Go call your Lord, your husband, and come here. And the woman said, I have no Baal. And Jesus said to her, You are right in saying, I have no husband. For you have had five husbands, or five lords. And he whom you now have is not your Lord. This you said truly. Who does she have now? Who's that? Who does she have now? Jesus. Yeah. Jesus is standing before her, the bridegroom in John, speaking to a woman at noon, at a well. And let's go a little further. For the Jews, the, I've talked to you about this before, a conversation is not like us today where we're like, you know, hey, how's it going, whatever, walking down the street. For the Jews to have a conversation with each other was a way to enter into a covenant with each other, to speak with each other. Okay, and in fact, you can see that. When you speak with somebody, you give them something which is yours, and they give you something which is theirs, and the two become one. For the Jews to have a conversation was a very sacred thing, and to have a conversation between a man and a woman was even, say, a more sacred or deeper thing. And to have a conversation with a woman in private by yourselves was something you just didn't do unless you were going to enter into a special covenant relationship with her. Okay? Would he have been speaking Hebrew with her? Um, yeah, or whatever the Samaritans probably have, yeah, in this whatever variation or what do you call that? Dialect. Okay. They would have, the Samaritans would have had. So it would have been Hebrew and not Aramaic. Yeah, I mean, he's coming from Galilee. What's that? It would, but it would have been Hebrew and not Aramaic. Well, Aramaic is just a, is a spoken tongue of... And it would be the same thing with the Baal and... Yes. Okay. Yeah. So Aramaic is just a, the spoken version. It's like, uh, say, Latin and Italian, or even probably even closer. Okay. So yeah. you, are you... So why did he ask her to go get her husband? In other words, what... What did she deliver on that quest? Right. Well, she's just, in 16, or in 15, rather, she just said, hey, yeah, give me this water so I won't have to drink anymore. So, kind of like what you were saying about her still being stuck on a natural level, when he points out, hey, go call your husband, and then shows her, I know, the next thing she says is, I see that you're a prophet. So, by him telling her, Look, I know your life, essentially. She realizes there's more to it that's going on than just the natural level. And what, even right? further, is it just the supernatural level that's going on? I mean, is John just writing, speaking of the Samaritans and their and their lords or their gods? Probably not. Probably with this woman, there actually is a natural connection. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know what I'm saying? She becomes an icon or an image of the whole of the Samaritan people. Okay, so it can be understood on two levels. Okay, we got, we're going to keep going after that. I think it's going to become uh, even more apparent. The Ignatius Commentary says the woman's personal life parallels the historic experience of the Samaritan people. According to Second Kings, the five foreign tribes who intermarried with the northern Israelite Israelites introduced five male deities into their religion. These idols were individually addressed as Baal, a Hebrew word meaning lord or husband. The prophets denounced Israel for serving these gods, calling such worship infidelity to its true covenant spouse, Yahweh. Hope was kept alive, however, that God would show mercy to these Israelites and become their everlasting husband in the bonds of a new covenant. This day has dawned in the ministry of Jesus, the divine bridegroom, who has come to save the Samaritans from a lifetime of struggles with five pagan husbands. Okay? Let's go... Uh, one verse further. Okay? Let's, well, start at verse 16. We'll move up verse 16. Jesus said to her, Go call your husband and come here. And the woman 
answered, I have no husband. And Jesus said to her, You are right in saying, I have no husband. For you have had five husbands, and he whom you now have is not your husband, is not your Lord. This you said truly. The woman said to him, Sir, I perceive that you are a prophet. Our fathers worshipped on this mountain. And you say that in Jerusalem is the place where men ought to worship. So notice where she goes. The text in the English is very difficult to understand. In our translation, is very difficult to understand. The five husbands, five lords, which, what's Jesus talking about? How does she understand him? But what's her reaction? He points out five lords that she's had. And what's her response? You're a prophet. You're a prophet and... And then she starts talking about where they're supposed to worship. Exactly. Immediately she responds by talking about the places of worship. So she's clearly starting to understand Christ on what level? The more supernatural. On a little more of a supernatural level. Okay? So there's this, this play going on. But by reading the text carefully, you can see that she, on what, how she's reading Christ's question about the five husbands or five lords. Okay? Yeah? Do you really think she had five, five husbands on a natural level? Or, or did, did, did she get it that he was talking about? I, I kind of would tend to think that uh, because of her response, that she totally understood what he was talking about. But, but I, it's, that's just, I have no idea. Yeah, the interpretation I read from that commentary is the most common where her life parallels that of the Samaritan people. Okay, But clearly she's understanding Christ on this level of the worship of God. Okay? All right. So, so it isn't five previous living lovers at all. It's reference to the five polytheistic right. gods. I say more importantly, it's that. That's the that's really the more the, the point of the text. It could be both without it could be both. Yeah. That's right. Yeah. Yeah. Jennifer, you agree with that? I think so. Okay. <laughs> We're shaking your head, yes. Alright. Verse 21. Jennifer, go ahead. Or verse verse uh, 20. 20. Our fathers worshipped on this mountain, and you say that Jerusalem is the place where men ought to worship. Jesus said to her, Woman, believe me, the hour is coming when neither on this mountain nor in Jerusalem will you worship the Father. You worship what you worship what you do not know, you worship what we know. Salvation is coming from the Jews. Okay, I meant to read you this little comment from uh, Romanos the Melodist. Romanos is a great uh, early church father and he wrote all these hymns down okay so this is one of the things he says he says go then and call your husband in return the woman said i think that i have no husband and the creator said to her truly do you have truly do you have none you have five the sixth you do not possess so that you may receive exceeding great joy and redemption she had five husbands and the sixth she did not have and leaving the five husbands in impiety, she now takes thee. For she did not conceal what had formerly been true from him, who knows all in advance. But she said, even if I formerly had husbands, I do not now wish to have these husbands, which I did have. For I now possess thee, who has now taken me in thy net. And I am by faith rescued from the filth of my sins, that I may receive exceeding great joy and redemption. Okay. So there you have it. Early church father, I'm not making it up. <laughs> okay. She identifies him as a prophet. Okay, which is also, we can see what in that. Oh, the, she, yeah, what Jennifer said. What's that? Starting to understand. She's starting, yeah, she's starting to see there's something going on with this guy. She had begun by referring to him as what? As sir, right? She began by seeing in him simply this man, this thirsty man of the Jews. And now suddenly she starts to perceive that he is a prophet. And it's interesting okay. because they rejected the prophets. So now she's addressing him as a prophet and coming to accept that which she rejected. She's kind of trying to see what kind of prophet he is because all the other prophets disclaimed the north, the of the north. So she's asking right away, well, what kind of prophet are you? Do you recognize the north or the south? All right. So you're saying, oh, she calls the prophet and then asks about where is he worshiped. Okay. There is one prophet, 
of the Old Testament that the Samaritans did accept. Who was it? Moses. Good. Why did you say that? Because he's very fresh. Exactly. Okay. <laughs> What was the answer? What was the answer? Oh. Moses, because he wrote the Pentateuch. Moses, yeah, he wrote the Pentateuch, okay. But Moses prophesied something extremely important for this scene. Yeah. No, see you louder. A prophet like me, uh, well, I, uh, it's, I think, uh, chapter 18 in Deuteronomy. Deuteronomy chapter 18. Turn there. Nice. Nice. Wow, that's great. See, we're getting somewhere during this Bible study. <laughs> I have to tell my wife, I'm not wasting my time. <laughs> no, I don't tell her I'm wasting my time. Chapter 18, verse 15. Chapter 18, verse 15. Secret, go ahead. Verse 15. The Lord your God will raise up for you a prophet like me from among you, from your brethren. Him you shall lead, just as you desired of the Lord your God at all on the day of the assembly when you said, Let me not hear again the voice of the Lord my God, or see this great fire any more, lest I die. And the Lord said to me, They have rightly said all that they have spoken. I will raise up for them a prophet like you from among their brethren, and I will put my words in his mouth, and he shall speak to them all that I command him. And whoever will not give heed to my words, which he shall speak in my name, I myself will require it of him. But the prophet who presumes to speak a word in my name, which I have not commanded him to speak, or who speaks in the name of other gods, that same prophet shall die. And if you say in your heart, how may we know the word which the Lord has not spoken? When a prophet speaks in the name of the Lord, if the word does not come to pass or come true, that is a word which the Lord has not spoken. The prophet has spoken uh, it presumptuously. You need not be afraid of him. When the Lord your God cuts off the nations whose land the Lord your okay, God... Okay, and so on. Okay, 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 okay. so there's this prophecy of a prophet who will come to fulfill the words of Moses. A prophet like Moses who they will accept. Okay? And there's a way to test them. This text is going to become very important in the next couple of chapters. Okay? And the Samaritan woman has seen in Christ the fulfillment of this prophecy. There's only one prophet she could accept, and it's that prophet prophesied by Moses. Okay? So again, she comes to a fullness of, of belief, or a fuller belief. Saying up from the Syrian says, If you are a king, why are you asking water from me? It was not thus that he had first revealed himself to her, but rather first as a Jew, and then as a prophet, and after that as the Messiah. From degree to degree, he led her and placed her on the highest degree. She first saw him as someone thirsting, and then as a Jew, as a Jew, and then as a prophet, and after that as God. As, uh, as someone thirsting, she per, she persuaded him. As a Jew, she recoiled from him. As a learned one, she interrogated him. As a prophet, she was reprimanded, and as the Messiah, she worshipped him. Okay. Go back to John and we'll just finish just read the last bit of the call it. Verse 22. You worship what you do not know. We worship what we know, for salvation is from the Jews. The hour is coming and now is when the true worshipers will worship the Father in spirit and truth. For such the Father seeks to worship him. God is spirit, and those who worship him must worship in spirit and in truth. The woman said to him, I know that the Messiah is coming, he who is called Christ. When he comes, he will show us all things. And Jesus said to her, I who speak to you am he. Okay. Again, going back to that, that idea of Christ and a source of living water. That Jesus is the place where the true worship of God will take place. 
It is no longer in Jerusalem in the temple where man will worship God. It is no longer on Mount Gerizim where man will worship God. It, man will worship God where? In Christ. In Christ. And that's why in chapter 2, you can, go, you can go back and see there when he identifies himself as a temple. Exactly. Exactly. And this is all connected with that. In verse 27, Thus then his disciples came, they marveled that he was talking with a woman. But none said, What do you wish, or why are you talking with her? So the woman left her water jar and went away into the city and said, Come see a man who told me all that I ever did. Can this be the Christ? And they went out to the city and were coming to him. So she has a full-blown conversion. Notice, she leaves her water jar, her source of natural water, right? Because she has drunk from the living water, who is Christ himself. And now, springing up within her is a fountain of living water. She goes out into the world and shares Christ with them. Meanwhile, the disciples besought him, saying, Rabbi, eat. But he said to them, I have no food to eat. Of what I have to do you which you do not know. So the disciples said to one another, Has anyone brought him food? And Jesus said to them, My food is to do the will of him who sent me, and to accomplish his work. Do you not say there are yet four months? Then comes the harvest. I tell you, lift up your eyes and see how the fields are already white for harvest. He who reaps receives wages and gathers fruit for eternal life, so that, so that sower and reaper may rejoice together. For here the same holds true, one sows and another reaps. I sent you to reap that, you, that for which you did not labor. Others have labored and you have entered into their labor. Many Samaritans from that city believed in him because of the woman's testimony. He told me all that I ever did. So, this, so when the Samaritans came to him, they asked him to stay with them. And he stayed there two days. And many more believed because of his word. How do you understand that? Is that good or bad? Chapter 1, verse 12. Yeah, to believe in the word of Christ. They have received him, not on the level of signs or on miracles, but they have believed and entrusted themselves to him. And they said to the woman, It is no longer because of your word that we believe, for we have heard for ourselves, and we know that this is indeed the Savior of the world. Okay? Let's conclude with that. We're going to come back next time and, um, and read real quickly over chapter... Oh my, we were supposed to get through chapter 5 today. Anyway, let's just stay ahead a little bit. Let's conclude. You know, when Apocalypse said, Helios finished the song, Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit. Amen.